Dedication and Preface to the Golden Treasury, edited by Francis T. Palgrave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dedication to Alfred Tennyson, Poet Laureate. This book in its progress has recalled often to my memory a man with whose friendship we were once honored, to whom no region of English literature was unfamiliar, and who, whilst rich in all the noble gifts of nature, was most eminently distinguished by the noblest and the rarest, just judgment and high-hearted patriotism. It would have been hence a peculiar pleasure and pride to dedicate what I have endeavored to make a true national anthology of three centuries to Henry Hallam, but he is beyond the reach of any human tokens of love and reverence, and I desire therefore to place before it a name united with his by associations which, whilst poetry retains her hold on the minds of Englishmen, are not likely to be forgotten. Your encouragement, given while traversing the wild scenery of Trerendinus, led me to begin the work, and it has been completed under your advice and assistance. For the favor now asked I have thus a second reason, and to this I may add the homage which is your right as poet, and the gratitude due to a friend whose regard I rate at no common value. Permit me, then, to inscribe yourself a book which, I hope, may be found by many a lifelong fountain of innocent and exalted pleasure, a source of animation to friends when they meet, and able to sweeten solitude itself with best society, with the companionship of the wise and the good, with the beauty which the eye cannot see, and the music only heard in silence. If this collection proves a storehouse of delight to labor and to poverty, if it teaches those indifferent to the poets to love them, and those who love them to love them more, the aim and the desire entertained in framing it will be fully accomplished. Preface This little collection differs, it is believed, from others, in the attempt made to include in it all the best original lyrical pieces and songs in our language, by writers not living, and none besides the best. Many familiar verses will hence be met with, also many which should be familiar. The editor will regard as his fittest readers those who love poetry so well that he can offer them nothing not already known and valued. For those who take up the book in serious and scholarly spirit, the following remarks on the plan and the execution are added. The editor is acquainted with no strict and exhaustive definition of lyrical poetry, but he has found the task of practical decision increase in clearness and in facility as he advanced with the work, whilst keeping in view a few simple principles. Lyrical has been here held essentially to imply that each poem shall turn on some single thought, feeling, or situation. In accordance with this, narrative, description, and didactic poems, unless accompanied by rapidity of movement, brevity, and the coloring of human passion, have been excluded. Humorous poetry, except in the very infrequent instances where a truly poetical tone pervades the whole, with what is strictly personal, occasional, and religious, has been considered foreign to the idea of the book. Blank verse and the ten-syllable couplet, with all pieces markedly dramatic, have been rejected as alien from what is commonly understood by song, and rarely conforming to lyrical conditions and treatment. But it is not anticipated, nor is it possible, that all readers shall think the line accurately drawn. Some poems, as Gray's Elegy, The Allegro, and Penseroso, Wordsworth's Ruth, or Campbell's Lord Ullen, might be claimed with perhaps equal justice for a narrative or descriptive selection, whilst, with reference especially to ballads and sonnets, the editor can only state that he has taken his utmost pains to decide without caprice or partiality. This also is all he can plead in regard to a point even more liable to question. 
what degree of merit should give rank among the best that a poem shall be worthy of the writer's genius that it shall reach a perfection commensurate with its aim that we should require finish in proportion to brevity that passion color and originality cannot atone for serious imperfections in clearness unity or truth that a few good lines do not make a good poem that popular estimate is serviceable as a guide-post more than a compass above all that excellence should be looked for rather in the whole than in the parts such and other canons have been always steadily regarded he may however add that the pieces chosen and a far larger number rejected have been carefully and repeatedly considered and that he has been aided throughout by two friends of independent and exercised judgment besides the distinguished person addressed in the dedication it is hoped that by this procedure the volume has been freed from that one-sidedness which must beset individual decisions but for the final choice the editor is alone responsible it would obviously have been invidious to apply the standard aimed at in this collection to the living nor even in the cases where this might be done without offence does it appear wise to attempt to anticipate the verdict of the future on our contemporaries even in the cases where this might be done without offence does it appear wise to attempt to anticipate the verdict of the future on our contemporaries should the book last poems by tennyson bryant clare lowell and others will no doubt claim and obtain their place among the best but the editor trusts that this will be effected by other hands and in days far distant chalmers vast collection with the whole works of all accessible poets not contained in it and the best anthologies of different periods have been twice systematically read through and it is hence improbable that any omissions which may be regretted are due to oversight the poems are printed entire except in a very few instances specified in the notes where a stanza has been omitted the omissions have been risked only when the piece could be thus brought to a closer lyrical unity and as essentially opposed to this unity extracts obviously such are excluded in regard to the text the purpose of the book has appeared to justify the choice of the most poetical version wherever more than one exists and much labor has been given to present each poem in disposition spelling and punctuation to the greatest advantage for the permission under which the copyright pieces are inserted thanks are due the respective proprietors without whose liberal concurrence the scheme of the collection would have been defeated in the arrangement the most poetically effective order has been attempted the english mind has passed through phases of thought and cultivation so various and so opposed during these three centuries of poetry that a rapid passage between old and new like rapid alteration of the eye's focus in looking at the landscape will always be wearisome and hurtful to the sense of beauty the poems have therefore been distributed into books corresponding one to the ninety years closing about sixteen sixteen two thence to seventeen hundred three to eighteen hundred four to the half century just ended or looking at the poets who more or less give each portion its distinctive character they might be called the books of shakespeare milton gray and wordsworth the volume in this respect so far as the limitations of its range allow accurately reflects the natural growth and evolution of our poetry a rigidly chronological sequence however rather fits a collection aiming at instruction than at pleasure and the wisdom which comes through pleasure within each book the pieces have therefore been arranged in gradations of feeling or subject the development of the symphonies of mozart and beethoven has been here thought of as a model and nothing placed without careful consideration and it is hoped that the contents of this anthology will thus be found to represent a certain unity as episodes in the noble language of shelley to that great poem which all poets like the cooperating thoughts of one great mind have built up since the beginning of the world 
as he closes his long survey the editor trusts he may add without egotism that he has found the vague general verdict of popular fame more just than those have thought who with too severe a criticism would confine judgments on poetry to the selected few of many generations not many appeared to have gained reputation without some gift or performance that in due degree deserved it and if no verses by certain writers who show less strength than sweetness or more thought than mastery in expression are printed in this volume it should not be imagined that they have been excluded without much hesitation and regret far less that they have been slighted throughout this vast and pathetic array of singers now silent few have been honored with the name poet and have not possessed a skill in words a sympathy with beauty a tenderness of feeling or seriousness in reflection which render their works although never perhaps attaining that loftier and finer excellence here required better worth reading than much of what fills the scanty hours that most men spare for self-improvement or for pleasure in any of its more elevated and permanent forms and if this be true of even mediocre poetry for how much more are we indebted to the best like the fabled fountain of the azores but with a more various power the magic of this art can confer on each period of life its appropriate blessing on early years experience on maturity calm on age youthfulness poetry gives treasures more golden than gold leading us in higher and healthier ways than those of the world and interpreting to us the lessons of nature but she speaks best for herself her true accents if the plan has been executed with success may be heard throughout the following pages wherever the poets of england are honored wherever the dominant language of the world is spoken it is hoped that they will find fit audience end of dedication and preface to the golden treasury